time we have, I, I can push. Mm -hmm. I can try and explain to you a bit uh, about using uh, software infrastructure we develop in order to work with the HR. So essentially, well of course, many, many solutions and uh, databases uh, doing this and that. Uh, and it's a question, why should you develop a, a new one? Somehow, uh, the features we need to do a really effective EHR analysis, uh, at least for us, uh, well, how to get from uh, commercial or other uh, solutions, because we we want to have a very flexible way of querying things temporarily, and because we want to do analysis that is really very very quick with modest well. So essentially what we have uh, generated, it's a package called Marine and is, it is open source uh, What does Narin mean? Recently released. <coughs> Narin, why, why is it Narin? Yes. <laughs> Narin is some kind of uh, uh, Uzbeki food. And uh, Misha, the legendary programmer that uh, worked with me for many years on, on developing uh, low, uh, like en database engines and stuff like that, uh, somehow was uh, touring Uzbekistan and was, uh, was very excited by this name. I don't know why. <laughs> so, it's like heard it. so there is no real name, uh, no real reason for the name. Uh, okay. So. The basic concept here, in order to understand how to use this, this system, is, uh, I don't know if you can see it from there, is the concept of a patient time space. Okay, in general, EHR data or medical data is organized in two dimensions of patients and time. <laughs> and we want to be very efficient in querying both dimensions, in particular the time. So typically, each type of data, here we were, are going to call it a track, is just a very sparse set of points in this patient time space. So what we do first when we get uh, any kind of data is to decompose the entire set of statistics we have on patients into a very large number of trucks. Okay, let's be specific. Let's assume we have lab records, diagnosis, and drugs. That's what you usually get in addition to some demography. So labs are easy. You take each type of lab and you create a truck for it. Okay, with a couple thousand. Okay, some of them super sparse and not useful for anything. Okay, and some are useful. Diagnosis is a bit more complicated. It comes in a certain, let's say, uh, annotation tree, ICD-9 or 10, or some organization will also have their own very special adaptation of the standard. <laughs> so you dissect it into tracks. It means that you cut the tree into very small pieces, not necessarily leaves, okay? And generate a very large number of tracks from each very small sub, okay? So the content of a truck can be quantitative, okay, if it's a lab, or can be categorial, okay, if it's a, a for example, a diagnosis code or, or anything else. So, so just to understand, so, the, so a track is like all of the ALT measurements in all the patients Kay. throughout all the time. Okay. Okay. So if you are used to relational database, says, then it's kind of a, taking the index concept to the limit, okay? 
if you're used to NoSQL and document based, then it's saying no, we need a very strong index to ask questions very quickly. Okay? Uh, so essentially, Nareen is providing you access, very, very efficient access to a very large set of tracks and allow you to ask or to, to generate statistics from that with some additional stuff. Uh, so let's go over the examples here uh, and how to actually use it and through it maybe explain some additional concepts. Sababa, so you see this? Yeah, yeah. maybe in large a bit. Okay. So, Baba. So, it's essentially uh, what we are going to use now is is the R binding of the package of the of the of the of the system. There is a Python binding that is uh, not open source at the moment. We have some troubles with that. If someone is a very very big Python expert and want to take it forward. We are happy to hear, but uh, uh, R is a terrible language, but we use it. <laughs> okay, so, so you start by just loading the packages, that's easy. Uh, <coughs> then you, you download, in that example, you download some data, okay? So it's a good point to describe to you what kind of data you have here. Unfortunately, we cannot expose uh, the Clali database, we are not allowed to, okay? But we want to have some mock database to work with. So, so what you have here is a is a one gig or so data uh, that is simulating something that is not far from looking like real patients and real data, in the sense that we have a population, we sample diagnosis according to the real distribution, then we sample lab tests according to the multivariate distribution condition on the diagnosis. So it's not completely absurd to train yourself with, but of course it's not real data. You won't discover real, uh, a lot of stuff. So it's mostly for, for the exercises. Okay, so as we said, the basic entity here is a truck. Here is an example of how a truck looks like. This creatinine, lab creatinine blood. So in general, we will organize the database into categories of trucks in terms of naming. It's very open, the, the infrastructure is open to anything, okay? Uh, but it's, it's good practice to have a lab dot something batch set of tracks and then dx dot something for diagnosis and medications, okay? So this is how the tracks look. Time is generally in this system is in a resolution of hours. It's a big deal, okay? Uh, you can generate an array in a resolution of minutes if you're working on a let's say an emergency room application or something like that. In population health, it doesn't serve much purpose, okay? There, is, there are some additional concepts related to time and, and conflicts in times that I'm not going into, okay? For example, what if two things happen in the same hour or uh, linkage between uh, the lab of a patient in the same day in the... Uh, general lab facility of the HMO and in the hospital after it was hospitalized, stuff like that, okay? It can get a bit dirty. So the system is supporting a lot of uh, facilities to data. The first thing you do is EMRDB connect, you connect to the database. In terms of implementation, we took great care to implement something that is really ex extremely efficient. So the, all, all of the tracks are sitting in shared memory, okay? With a lot of... Uh, facilities to, to, al to allow really quick access. It means, and that's an important concept in EHR analysis, at least the way we do it, is that by and large it's read only. So it's read only, it's pre-indexed, it means that you can do a lot of things very, very efficiently. Okay? So any standard database implementation you're going to use is based on the concept that people are going to change stuff in the middle of analysis. And that's, so design goals are completely different. Our design goal, so the, the re if you want to use it for other data because it sounds attractive, is there documentation how to build it? Can, can, yeah. Uh, it's very, very strong. Uh, absolutely. So you connect to the database. Uh, EML track LS will tell you which type of tracks you have there. 
with grapping uh, various terms. Here we have two types of creatinine drugs, one of them from the blood, one of them from the urine. They are going to appear in different times. Uh, in, in a standard uh, implementation, I may have a huge table, right? With patient ID, time, and all the labs sorted there, okay? So here I separated it all. I lost, in a way, the coupling, okay? Which the system should give me back some. We'll see how, okay? So the first, is, it's a database, essentially. So the first thing you can do is to extract stuff. As I told you, it's a read-only, so you cannot write. Uh, but you can, by the way, just as a comment, generate new drugs, okay, that's okay, or generate computer drugs, the database is supporting that, but in that case you'll have two separate databases, the global one and a user database where you are writing temporary stuff or stuff you want to write. Uh, so extract is just giving you, uh, in a certain way, initially all the data, but that's boring, okay, that's not a very good thing to do. Uh, we'll talk about how to improve it in a second. But it's important now to introduce a, new, a second concept, which is called track expression. So the system allows you to compute anything you want with tracks as if they are variables. Okay? So here we are just multiplying uh, something by two, but we can divide track with any function you want, including callbacks and everything. Okay? This is still working very efficiently. Because the system is, is running by, uh, by running this, I don't know if we should go into the technical details, by running it in vector mode. So, 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 so operations are still very, very efficient. They are done, done in, in bulks of, of thousands of, uh, of operations each time. And of course, all of it is highly parallelized. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, OK, so for example, uh, an I, uh, a simple exercise is to extract the BMI of individuals based on weight and lab weight and lab height. Uh, okay, another introductory note before we get into the really important stuff, okay? extract data, there is an ID of the patient, okay, and times, okay, and so each patient will have several appearances in this extraction, that's okay. Think of a patient time and without saying anything in addition, we are just treating it as, as one, you'll see there are very strong facilities to allow you to, to, to modulate that. Uh, time is, again, it's annoying, it's an annoying unit that very hard to analyze to, to work with because these are the number of minutes since the independence or the big battle of uh, the independence of Uzbekistan. As, uh, so uh, that's the epoch of this system. So you want to translate? Ma? You're serious? You can, because Narin they, they is, is uh, called after uh, some Uzbeki food stuff. Uh, <laughs> but you don't want to, you, you don't want to mess with it, so you, 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 you can translate this, of course, into a uh, to uh, day, month, and years of normal people, not Misha. Uh, okay, now to the really <coughs> two important concepts that make this system strong, okay? The first is iterator, and the second is a virtual truck, okay? So essentially, in order to be efficient, okay, like the, 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 the naive implementation of going over trucks over every hour, okay, for every patient. So there are about 200,000 hours in the Klali database, relevant, like 20 years, okay? And there are 4 million patients. So this is very, very inefficient, okay? And the whole representation internally is, uh, is sparse. So running over a truck is easy. You jump over all only the relevant part. But this is still not very, not, not sufficiently efficient. So every time you apply any kind of the operations of Narin, like extracting data or doing anything else, you assume some iterator is, uh, is actually in effect, okay? The, 
source of the iterator can be usually or simply another track. So here, for example, you are asking for the lab of creatinine, blood, and glucose blood, okay? And you iterate over all instances where a patient was diagnosed, okay, with ICD-9-585, okay? The setter, this is CK. So that's the first concept. So it means this will run very quickly, or much more quickly than going over all hours uh, in the history of this database. It, it's, it will only sample very efficiently those time points. And the, the algorithms below have good enough facilities to make sure the other tracks are not going to be surveyed completely. But of course, that's not a very useful outcome, as you see here. You only get a not an NA for all of those values, because by the hours by which this guy got the diagnosis, there was no lab test at this time. Okay? The lab test was done maybe later, maybe before. Okay? So anything useful you, you want to do with this type of temporal data needs some time modulation, which is why we introduced virtual tracks. Okay? So virtual track is a kind of, think of it as a callback or something like that, that have some facilities in it to determine, okay, <coughs> the relationship between the iterator and a certain time window relative to it. For example, five years from the time of the iterator, two years, two years forward in time, anything goes, okay? And some manipulation of all the data that falls within the window that is defined by the virtual park. This manipulation can be very flexible, okay? For example, what you see here is a virtual track that we create. The name is created in five years. The source track is the blood test creatinine, okay? The time shift is from the time of the iterator five years back. And the function gives you the latest value in the time window, which means that you get the creatinine value that is the latest available, okay, within the five years time relative, okay, to the diagnosis. Now this already starts to be interesting because Starting to code this with a relational database is not going to be fine, okay? It's going to some indexes, some, and it will be very slow. And this is super quick. It's very native in that respect. Okay, so now once we did two virtual tracks to get creatinine and glucose in a five years time window, latest time point, we can extract the data and we get the actual creatinine and glucose pertains to the latest measurements before the diagnosis of CKD. Okay? Let's be a bit more general about creating virtual track. Here is the, the function usage, okay? In general, as we said, you have a name, you have a source track, you have some time shift you do here, and you have the function. And there are other parameters maybe we may not want to go into now, just to mention which type of functions you can apply. Okay, so there are Boolean values like whether they exist at all measurements within the time window. You can sample uniformly any observed value within the window. Uh, you can give us the time of the sample, okay, which is also important. You can generate the frequent, the number of values, the earliest or the latest or the, uh, or the closest. And there are all kinds of functions that give you uh, information about what time exactly you actually sample, you actually found, okay? Because in many cases, you want to know if within the five years the creatinine value was four years before the diagnosis or one year, okay? Uh, so there are all kinds of delta times and manipulations such as so on and so forth. That's for categorical. For quantitative data, you, you, you have a lot of additional statistics like percentage, anything you, you can probably think of. The point is that this is implemented very natively, okay? So it means that the algorithms, when it runs, including on thousands of tracks simultaneously, is computing it very efficiently. So it, 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 if you try it, you see it, it, it is very, very quick. Sababa. Okay, so now, uh, once we have this, uh, this virtual track, or for example, just as, as additional example here, 
we create not just the value, okay, of the uh, lab test five years in the five years before, okay, but we in that case we want to know what is the delta times so or how many months or hours or days this measurement was taken before the diagnosis or before the position of the iterator. So that's creating in five years delta time. Okay. Uh, once you do that, you can extract together all the data, the, the values themselves, and the time lag of the of, of the lab test and the diagnosis. Okay. So that's this gives you a lot of power. Okay. To to ask a lot of uh, a lot of questions, and it can get even more complicated, of course. Okay. So now let's introduce another concept, which is filter. So a filter is, is a mechanism that allows you to restrict the iterator, okay, to a certain subset of the space, okay. Again, all of it comes from the fact that if you really want to do very extensive analysis, for example, you want to find all the diagnosis in the system, okay, and characterize and extract all the labs before them and build any, all of those things takes really a lot of time if you're not, if you're not making them uh, super efficient. So here, for example, we are going to create a filter, okay, uh, that is asking if there was an observation of chronic kidney disease in the past. <coughs> Why do we want that? Because for every patient, if we really want to distinguish between uh, the beginning of a disease, okay, the time where it was first diagnosed, and other instances where there was a, a diagnosis called of CKD simply because routinely during patient visits it has been listed, uh, we, will, we will have to condition by, by, by the effect that there was no CKD diagnosis in the past. Okay? So that's easy to do. We create a filter CKD in the past based on this data. The time shift is 120 years in the past, okay? And now when we do our extraction of the creatinine and glucose labs, okay, with an iterator that is all the instances of CKD diagnosis, we are going to add the filter, no CKD in the past. So now the system will tell us only those points in patient time space, okay, where it is the first pass or the first appearance of the diagnosis, which is exactly what we want to do if we want to ask questions on incidence uh, or transition between no CKD diagnosis, yes, CKD diagnosis. Again, doing it in other facilities is possible, of course, but not fun. Another type of filter can be a filter on some conditional effect on a, a, on a quantitative <coughs> track. For example, here is a nice example, abnormal glucose, okay? So glucose over 100 is usually considered pre-diabetic. So let's create a filter that is asking if glucose, now we are using a virtual track, remember glucose five years tells you what is the glucose level at the latest available time in a window of five years. It's getting complicated, but this is what you get. And we are going to condition on the fact that it's 100 or above. Now it's easy to do, to find CKD labs on abnormal glucose, okay? We do the extraction as before, but now our filter is, you don't have CKD in the past, okay? And also, you have abnormal glucose. So I think if you are used to programming, you, see the, you, you, you can see the logic and how you, you can take this forward. Uh, that's a value filter. Uh, yeah, another type of value filter in that case allow you to condition on categorical tracks. Here, it's a good point to remind you that a categorical track, for example, diagnosis, okay, have certain, let's say, sub, sub diagnosis. So CKD, the ICD-9 code or the ICD-10 code would have subsets of uh, more, for example, severe case is going to be uh, 585.4. Here it is called 14 for annoying reasons of leading zeros uh, that we had to take into account. So, so actually it's point 0.4. So you can condition now on ICD-9585. 
generate a severe filter, which is conditioned on the fact that the actual code, the categorical code, is faulty. Now that's easy. Now you can extract what we did before. No CKD in the pass, but the first pass is severe, which is maybe less common. But okay, another type of of restriction you can add to the system is uh, you you want to sometimes restrict the time. That's also an important comment on this type of data, longitudinal data, which relates to how well you can trust the history in close to the epoch of the system. Let's assume you start recording at 2001, okay? Essentially, you don't have any history for 2002, 2002 2003, 2004. Someone can come to the clinic, okay, with a CKD, and you would condition on the fact that there is no CKD in the past. There will no be, not be CKD in the past, even if the guy is uh, have a kidney disease for 10 years now. So usually there is a tkufat akshara, I don't know how you say it in English, training okay? Yeah. Training period? It's not a really, it's a burning period of the system, okay, maybe, okay? It's an embargo period where you are not actually allowed, if you want to do things real, to, to use the statistics there, okay? Uh, for, for outcomes, because you don't really know what happened in the past of that, okay? We usually use three years in this system, okay? Uh, for, but it depends on what type of disease you want to work with. So what you see here is that here uh, net time of Ezra were more extreme. They started the time only 2008 and restricted between 2008 and 2022. So another type of restriction you can do. Uh, okay. So one special case which is very important is age and sex. Okay. Uh, for age, we have tracks that are the date of birth of a patient, okay? The date of birth of a patient would have just one entity for each patient, so it would be a relatively boring track, okay? So, but it's a nice example to show you how, to how you use a virtual track. So if you, you can generate a virtual track age, the source is patient date of birth, the time shift is always, and the the function is the earliest time, okay? And that exactly tells you, uh, or the delta to the earliest, sorry. So at each point of the iterator, this will compute for you the time that passed since the birth, so, which is the age, okay? Same thing for, for, for this, okay? Uh, and so this is what, what you see here. We extract the age in years, okay? The iterator is the CKD. Diagnosis, the filter is this onset, first pass, and we are going to name the data as age. So here are the ages of people when they were first diagnosed with uh, CKD. Sex is a similar exercise. We are just putting the sex uh, as the categorical value of the date of birth. Okay, so now we are ready to start and pull just a bit of statistics, here we are extracting the ages and we are computing the age of diagnosis, first diagnosis for females and males in the system. Remember it's a simulated database, but overall the epidemiology is not far from it. Okay. Mitsuyan. Uh, okay, now, now we want to discuss a bit uh, like more analysis. A lot of the stuff we want to do here depends greatly on the background. And one of the main reasons for developing this system was that we want to be able to query the background e efficiently without making compromises, okay? In particular, you're probably, if you're doing analysis yourself or you're having talks, uh, it's very common to use an index date approach for analysis, like decide that you do the analysis on 2015, 1st January, collect all the patients around this time and do some certification around this time. We don't want that, okay? It's, a, it's too much of a compromise for us. We want to use the entire range of years we have in the system, okay? Uh, 
And there are many approaches where the controls are actually sampled somehow and are actually a small cohort, which is legit, okay? But if you can just pull over the entire population, uh, we, we, we think it's better, and this system is powerful enough to do that for us. So there are features of patients that, that are important in that respect in defining the background, so which, which is uh, birth and death, so what period of time they are present in the system in general, because they are alive. But also, and not less important for this type of analysis, is whether they are covered in a certain time point. Whether they are part of the insurance of, of this part, particular EHR at any time point, okay? And this can be <coughs> a non-continuous fragmented drug which can be complicated and change the results. For example, in Israel there are migration between the HMOs occasionally and stuff like that, that are age-related, uh, disease-related, all of it can generate strong confounders, okay? So we are, so we have tracks in the system, <coughs> and this is something that we should always try and get, which describe whether people are registered or left for good, okay? Like left the system, move to Maccabi. Uh, and, uh, and we need to use them. So here you, we have all kinds of filters that you can generate, born, dead, registered, left for good, that you can condition on if you want to understand your background properly. Which brings us to the first real task of computing incidence rate for a certain condition. So to compute an incidence rate, okay, you need to count how many cases you have of a certain thing. That's call it CKD onset, okay? And you need to normalize by the potential, okay? Which essentially is the total time under risk, okay? How many patient months or years, depending on, on, on the units, people were exposed or, to the risk of developing this. In particular, they were not already diagnosed and they were in the system. So, so, so it has to put this counting the new case, which I think we already discussed tools that are enough for doing that, and normalizing, which is something we haven't discussed, okay? So to do the, the, the enumerator here, we are, and do it efficiently without just extracting all cases and doing it by hand, we have another function of Marine that is called EMRDist, again, which is a very efficient way of generating distributions of certain values. In that case, we want to collect the distribution of uh, age, okay, and sex. Uh, so we provide two tracks, or two track expression. Here it's age in years and the sex, okay. We are generating breaks for each of them to generate the distribution. And we define the iterator, in that case these are what we introduced about is the cases of CKD diagnosis. The filter is that it's onset. It means that it hasn't happened in the past. Okay, we give it names and we are restricting the time uh, such that very early cases would be disregarded because we don't know they are really new. And then the system runs and generates for us this table, which is a two-dimensional distribution counting in a tidy format count how many cases we had per age and sex range. And again, the point is that this is going to be very quick on many, many, on many, many different cases. But that's easy. And it's also not surprising that it is fast. Now the denominator. To under the denominator, essentially, we have to go over the entire patient time space, OK? Find those, for each patient, find the time period in which he, he or she was like theoretically uh, healthy or not having the disease, and also covered by the database, okay? And for that, compute the total time in order to estimate later the risk or the, the rate. For that, we have another type of, a, of an iterator, okay? And this iterator is called just a, a bit iterator. So a bit iterator is doing the horrible thing of running over the entire thing, okay? at a certain resolution. In that case, it is running over months. 
The reason for this iterator to be actually efficient, and it can be very efficient if, even if you are, uh, is that it has filters, okay? And the, so, and the filters are sparse expressions. So the way it is implemented below, on top of that, the fact that all of it is in shared memory, ta 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 ta, is that each of the filters provide the system with a, with a hint as to where is the first time that is worth even searching for, okay? And this generates a very efficient uh, iteration process. So in that case, the filter is that we want the guy to be born, not dead, registered, not left for good, and he is not having the disease. So that's the denominator. So we run th this entire thing, okay? And again, using EMR disk, we don't want in that time to generate a temporary table that will give us uh, like m many, many millions of records. That's boring, okay? And will blow up our memory. So this is what we are doing here. So email this, come back with, with exactly the numbers we need. And that's carefully controlled. So now incidences can be easily computed. It's real, okay? Uh, so we compute the, in the incidence rate by just dividing uh, the numbers of new cases by the potential. And we get with some, in that case, confidence intervals that are not more than binomial confidence intervals. And you get the results here, OK? So that's showing why, or starting to show why we need this type of system if we want to do analysis uh, flexibly with this type of temporal lab. OK, so we still have time. Just a bit. Let's go one step forward to do survival analysis. So in survival analysis, OK, we are doing something which is in a way similar to, to, uh, to incidents, OK? Uh, so let's go over what we are going to do now. We're going to estimate the survival of CKD patients, okay? Uh, assuming they were diagnosed at a certain time, the age, 60 to 65, okay? Uh, just like the patient date of birth, we have a patient date, date of death uh, track, which in some cases is missing, because they are, everyone was born, but some people in the system are, of course, alive, okay? So we start, let's go over it carefully this time. We create a filter, okay? This will be called male 60 to 65, which is us conditioning on the date of birth and the time shift. So the value should be uh, uh, forcing it to be a male, value equal one, and the time shift is forcing it, the age to be correct. So that's minus 65 to 60 times the yield function that gives you how many hours you have in a year. Then we create a virtual track that is called survival. Survival is going to use the patient da date of death, okay, with a time shift that is 120 years forward, okay, and we'll use the virtual track function delta earliest. So it gives you the earliest time where you find something in this track. In that case, date, de date of death can only have one entry. So it will compute for you how much time uh, is separating between the current iterator and death, if it, it is present. So we run this guy and we get survival data that looks like that, okay? This is the number of hours from the current iterator, the current time, and death. All sexes here are one, males, okay? And some people are not NA because they are alive at the moment. Okay. So now, now our life is, is relatively good, okay? We can, uh, we can actually compute, in addition to the survival statistics, we want to sample uh, controls. So how do we sample controls, okay? We are generating background patients, okay? With the same type of iterator I promised you before that can go over the actual uh, dense uh, beans in the patient time space. And we are going to sample it using this, again, again uh, application of EMR extract with an iterator that just go over 
uh, all of the candidates and sample them. This is generating for us a, a long list here. I don't think we need to go into this call, but you are welcome to go over it. What we are actually going to do now is just to make sure that we sample the right number of controls per age and sex. And after we do all that, we have survival statistics, okay, here. We know the follow-up time for each individual, which is important because the actual time where we are seeing the incidence of CKD can be 2018, and then we have only two years of follow-up time, or it can be 2008, and then we have 12 years of follow-up time. And all of this should go into our estimation of survival, okay? So we generate this table of control and disease and apply classical tools to estimate uh, a couple of mile care, which in that case it's easy, okay? Showing you, of course, that having CKD is, is not good. You won't be surprised for males, 60 to 65. Uh, which again, that's not well. So 10, 10 years from, from 60 to 65 is still not an age where you should uh, see uh, dramatic mortality. Uh, what? Okay, still have time. So you can, you can play with the system in many, many additional ways. This, when you do this, maybe we'll skip the time to outcome, so we maybe have a bit of more time for discussion. Uh, but all of it is, is available. Uh, okay, you can, you can play with the system now to build a CKD predictor, okay? That's relatively easy, okay? You will go and generate a cohort distribution of how many, uh, how many people you have per age, per sex, okay? Not restricting it now to a, to a certain age range. You are going to define patients that, you're, that are going to be in your control. This is something that you are going to have to sample, okay? Because you want to now train a, a classifier. So you need positive and negative cases. So this, again, maybe sh we shouldn't go into the actual details. Then you can use the system to extract any kind of data relevant to that. So in that case, EMR, track LS, lab dot something will give you all the labs in the system, all the tracks that are starting with lab, so 96 in this, this simulated database. Uh, and now we are using what we've learned, okay? We will build a virtual track for each of the labs. Uh, we will decide on some time modulation, okay? In that case, uh, we are just uh, sampling one instance, okay? between one year to five years before the diagnosis. We will usually don't want to use diagnosis that are very close, eh, labs that are very close to the diagnosis itself. Uh, but again, you can play with this freely. Sampling is one strategy that would maybe try to mitigate problems with patients that are oversampled or undersampled and then may have more or less statistical stability. For example, averaging would may introduce biases. Okay? But you can do anything you want. For example, you can generate several types of tracks or several types of features, one for the first year, second year, third year, and, and play with time series and stuff like that. <coughs> okay, so now you are extracting this data for all the labs, all the virtual tracks you generate. Uh, in essentially one line here, okay? So these are all the labs, the virtual labs, okay? If you're not an R programmer, you'll, you'll find this syntax terrible. Uh, if you are an, an R programmer, you'll also find this syntax terrible. <laughs> but it is working. So now you are generating a big table, in that case it's not that huge, with the, the relevant statistics that you wanted. That's already uh, a data set that is ready uh, to be applied to any of your favorite uh, modeling slash uh, classifier construction. In that case, XP Boost is, uh, can be applied to it easily. 
direct. Okay. Okay. So you see here, even in this uh, simulated data, you get some AUC for terrible, but still non-zero uh, for this particular uh, diagnosis. So this notebook have also kind of some additional examples and also all kinds of exercise you can you can try and play with. Okay. Uh, <coughs> The system is also, as I told you in the previous module, is also the basis for a GUI, okay, that is trying to give physicians or people that are not programmers or data scientists uh, access to a lot of those facilities. In particular, what you want to formalize based on this, this is just what I described you, is just basic raw compute power for, for doing such analysis, not providing you semantics. Okay, so there are libraries that allow you to do more semantic, like defining cohorts properly. Like an engine to define cohorts based on exclusion and inclusion criteria using the facilities I described to you before. Uh, here is something that is very natural to do. So we have software to do that, but we also try to develop like user interface for people that cannot code. That allow you to do the same and extract all kinds of uh, statistics around it. This is proving to be reasonably powerful uh, even though the actual utility of, of doing these types of, uh, of analysis is something that n none of us is here is, is completely convinced with, okay? uh, in terms of discovering something really new in medicine. What is, in my mind, clearly missing, and a system like that can, can make a difference, is making the actual data, the empirical behavior of the population, available to the physician. So currently, when a physician wants to ask uh, what is common for a certain disease that he is not used to see a lot, okay? So he goes to something called up-to-date, okay, and, and look up uh, all kinds of papers, evidence from the literature. And this is, in some cases, it's, it's, it's really sporadic, okay? So there, are, there is a report in, from 95, from 2002, this is what everybody is citing, it's a cohort of 50 people, and that's it, okay? While at the same time, given a system like that, and, and, and some GUI that is not that sophisticated, you can actually ask the question on your own population, on your own system, and ask what is happening to people with a certain diagnosis, what is the typical lab uh, distribution, what is the incidence rate of, or the, 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 uh, of, of certain outcomes from that, okay? Which is, is not done today, is not available, not accessible to physicians, and I think that's, at least this can be changed using this type of system in addition to be able to to do the stuff uh, I showed you uh, uh, this morning. So I think for coding, that's that's enough. You are really welcome to play. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you're, you're really welcome to ask us. And if you want to engage or do something with that, feel free. Okay. And Maybe it's a good time for more questions about this system or in general. Yeah, we still have, we still have time. We still have some. Yes. So, so I would like to ask, I mean, you work with Clinic, right? What's the most uh, significant discovery you made? I mean, as you said before, predictions, you can make a lot of predictions, but scientific uh, results that can be used by physicians, what would be the highlight that you can I don't think we have any scientific discovery that can be used by the physicians at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't think that uh, the field as a whole <laughs> have a lot of, of, uh, of such discoveries. Uh, in terms of the medical literature, okay, there is a constant stream of reports that are very important for day-to-day -day medical practice. And a system like that and the type of, of analysis we are doing is useful in that respect. But, but this is not what we do, okay? We want to discover new biology or discover new tools, and for that we need more, okay? 
To begin with, we started this project not for the, not, not for the sake of doing the HR analysis, okay? This is for us a basis for doing a prospective molecular analysis. So if you are asking what, what am I optimistic about, I'm optimistic about being able now to use this type of data to stratify cohorts in a smart way, okay, such that we can engage them in prospective analysis, for example, take blood. In our lab, we do single cell RNA sequencing of the blood. In other lab, people are doing other types of modalities, okay, but instead of doing them blindly, doing them on the basis of what the system is currently doing. So in that respect, I think that I'm, I'm very excited, very optimistic about being able to do real things in MDS, okay? And in general, in hematological disorders, that's a relatively low hanging fruit, okay? Uh, that, that I believe can make a quick difference. For the other thing, while there are things that you can, or quantifications you can uh, generate from the EHR that are theoretically useful, the ability to enroll them into the system, as you probably know, as all of us probably know, is that's a big, big hurdle at the moment. Uh, for, for many different reasons, and it's not just the fault of the system itself, okay? So we just discussed with some people in the coffee break, the main problem in, the, in those systems, in, in challenges in population health, that as, as we discussed in the previous lecture, is actually a compliance. Uh, how people are uh, responding to treatment, not necessarily the dis the, a better decision, okay? So if you're, ask, you're telling someone, I'll, I'll, I'll c I can predict better or, or give you better uh, indicators for starting CKD intervention, okay? There are many people that, uh, each family physician probably has several patients where it is clearly CKD intervention is clearly needed and they are just not responding, okay? So they will tell you, okay, so what? Uh, I think for, for me personally, do dealing with this data so intimately, it was it's super important to really understand how the system is working at the moment and what can actually we hope to achieve, okay? And where we should concentrate our effort. And for me now, the direction is clear where, where I, where we should. So, so in that context, uh, maybe going back to Tom, I don't know if he's, I don't see, but the NLP part that was asked, you uh, people asked before, and probably you know, the genomic test that can be available, imaging, is that part of your future planning? So with respect to what type of data we need, okay, let's divide it into le legacy and, and forward looking, okay? In terms of legacy, NLP, and stuff like that, I'm not a great believer in that, okay? For the reason that when you have complete oh, coverage of the, the, of the operational system, uh, and I know that in the US in many cases you don't have it, okay? But, um, but that's, that's, a, that's, that's a problem, okay? But in many other systems you have it already or will have it, okay? So a lot of the the reasons for doing NLP are getting a much lower priority, okay? Because you can, instead of understanding if someone has a, a, a background condition of CKD from the write-up of the, of, of the physician in the ER, okay, you look at the, at, at the database of the insurer, okay, back in time or forward in time, okay, and you and you'll know if the guy has so, so the type of stuff you can get from NLP or from additional data that there is there is more refined, okay? There are cases where I can see some opportunities like in some classification of cancer, pathological reports. Even there, I'm, I'm worried about using this data as is and not. Yeah. I mean, even there, you can get the radiology images instead of the radiology exactly. images. And Exactly. So in terms of legacy, this was one of the reasons for us uh, not to make a big effort there, okay? It's also a big de-identification problem that we, we were happy to go uh, around, okay? Uh, in terms of imaging, 
and that's that's of course a big opportunity for for, for well defined disease. I think it's uh, integrating it properly with uh, with the EHR is I is something that must be done maybe better than is being done today, given better access to data. Genomics, okay, uh, is another instance. I I'm I I'm actually I am optimistic about the ability to do more with with genetics, with genomics, uh, when you can integrate rich EHR, rich representation of the phenotype, okay? Uh, we already started to see some of it when we are working uh, in, in, let's say, the UK Biobank, which at least have EHR that is not bad, okay? It's not complete, longitudinally, but it's not bad, and genetics, and you can do a lot of Refined interpretations of of, uh, of GWSs if you are treating the phenotype uh, more, let's say, more comprehensively, not just identifying a condition, okay, but look at actual, for example, look at the scores I, I described to you in, in the previous lecture and stratify some GWSs by that or doing analysis for those scores directly. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Being able to, for example, given availability of such data in Israel, can have big opportunities for pharmacogenomics and stuff like that. It's not something that people are really exhausted. But even more than that, I'm, as, as, as I said before, I'm excited about being able to use new types of biology, essays, like model technology, uh, various omics, okay? But, that, but done in a focused way to, to make a difference on, on diseases. For that, I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very Questions out of time, no? Uh, so let's thank Carlos.